Okay, well, so welcome everybody to this uh, second webinar uh, with the University of Dayton. Uh, my name is Paula, I'm in charge of international relations at WADE, and I am uh, glad to welcome you all for this uh, new seminar uh, on constitutional law. Um, we are going to have uh, our guest speaker, um, uh, the Dean of the University of Dayton, Jeff Smith, and uh, Pablo Yanello, a professor of WADE, will be uh, the moderator of this uh, webinar uh, from the academic standpoint. So I'm going to give um, the floor to Pablo to uh, give you the overview of today's webinar, and then uh, we are going to continue with uh, the topic of constitutional law. I hope you can uh, enjoy uh, today's webinar. Uh, I would like you to um, uh, keep your microphones uh, you know, muted during the, the webinar so that there's no uh, uh, noise during the, the, the presentation. And please, uh, once we finish uh, with the presentations, uh, feel free to ask any questions in the chat or by raising your hands, okay? Thank you. Pablo, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Paula. Uh, hi Jeff, uh, hi everybody, uh, it's great to have you on board on this second webinar, um, uh, which we are making in collaboration with the University of Dayton Law School. Hopefully it will be uh, uh, one of many activities that we are going to uh, be performing together. So as Paula mentioned, I will provide you with a very brief uh, overview of the webinar. I'm very uh, um, kind of a welcoming words um, presenting uh, Professor Schmidt topic and after that I will uh, give the floor to Jeff and as Paula also mentioned I will uh, I will ask you to keep questions uh, to the end if you want if you want to type the questions on the chat I will keep the record of the questions too so just give me a minute so that I can start presenting oh, let me move to full screen mode um just so there we are. um so as i said this is our second webinar co-sponsored by the university of Dayton school of law and wale and uh the structure of the seminar will be the, the welcoming that we are having now some introductions um i will introduce uh, professor schmidt just in a minute then um, Professor Smith, uh, he will address uh, topics related with uh, U.S. constitutional law uh, so that then we can move to a Q&A section. And after that, uh, in order to close the seminar, uh, provide with uh, our next events, the upcoming events. This will be the structure of, the, of today's webinar. Uh, so. Uh, assistant Dean Chet Smith uh, is Assistant Dean for Graduate Program of the University of Dayton Law School. He oversees the non-JD programs at Dayton Law. Uh, Professor Schmidt research explores issues of state power within our, the U.S. federal system. He has written extensively articles on uh, uh, Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution, including Property Clause, Full Faith and Credit Clause, and Fugitive Slave Clause. Uh, Dean Schmidt also teach civil procedure, constitutional law, contracts, and criminal procedure. So, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, today uh, is going to deal about uh, U.S. legal system, especially U.S. constitution law in a comparative perspective. So, just to remind you very briefly that um, our two countries, Argentina and the United States of America, share a common background. Uh, from the constitutional law point of view, as most of you probably remember, our original constitution was based in the U.S. Constitution, so we share uh, pretty many, many features of the U.S. constitutional structure, uh, including the federal structure. Now, uh, of course, we cannot address all the topics in one webinar, so uh, Professor Schmidt uh, has selected some key topics that are relevant in today's uh, constitutional law, especially in the U.S. So as many of you or most of you um, might be aware of, uh, we are 
nearly to U.S. presidential elections. Uh, so how the, uh, the U.S. Uh, legal system uh, is designed for presidential elections. You know that it's not the same in Argentina. We elect our president with direct voting. In the U.S. you have the electoral college system. So Professor Schmidt is going to address that. Um, a lot of has been discussed in Argentina about constitutional restrictions due to the COVID pandemic. How that issue is addressed by uh, U.S. constitutional law and U.S. courts. Uh, and also, which is uh, the role of uh, judges in the U.S. and how they are elected. This is a topic that Judge Huffman also addressed and Professor Schmidt might also address from a U.S. constitutional point of view. Uh, that being said, I will give the floor to uh, uh, Professor Jeff Smith. So, Jeff, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Um, as you mentioned, I'm, my talk is going to focus on constitutional law and these three specific issues. Now, in doing that, of course, I, I could spend hours probably talking about any one of these issues. And so there's only so much detail I can go into. So we're, we're going to, as you mentioned, hold time for Q&A at the end. And so I, I hope that um, if you want more detail on any of these issues, you feel free to write in the comments box or just talk at the end of the Q&A, and I'd be happy to go into more detail. So there's a lot going on in the United States right now. There, there's a lot going on in terms of politics, but also constitutional law and the intersection of those two topics. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, and, and of course, some of those issues are global, but uh, the 2020 election, of course, is something specific to the United States that I'd like to talk about as well. Before we get into the election or the role of judges and the appointment of the new justice of the Supreme Court, though, I thought I would spend some time to talk about the United States' response to COVID-19, and especially how the U.S. Constitution has influenced that response. So, You've probably heard that the United States has had a sometimes called disorganized response or a lack of a uniform response to COVID. And that's in large part due to federalism. Uh, the United States, of course, has a federal government, but powers are shared between the federal government and the states. And it's a very different system than what you see in many countries in that the federal government is actually fairly to some extent limited in what it can do, it's, it's practical powers of legislation. Now, perhaps the biggest obstacle is just that the way our constitution is written, it's relatively difficult to pass legislation. Uh, to pass legislation in the United States, especially anything that would raise or spend money, typically it's going to start in the House of Representatives, some bills will start in the Senate, but it has to go through both chambers and be signed by the president. For ordinary legislation, you actually need, uh, the Senate has what is known as the filibuster. And so a minority of the senators can block legislation for the entire country. And effectively what that means is that you need pretty overwhelming consensus, uh, bipartisan consensus to get legislation through, especially at this moment in time when we have divided government, where one political party controls the House, the Democrats, and the Republicans control the other two branches. And so it's relatively difficult because of the way the system is set up to pass legislation in the first place. And then the Constitution limits what the federal government can actually do. And what I mean by that is Congress, the federal Congress, is limited to a set of enumerated powers, powers that are specifically listed in the Constitution. The most comprehensive of those powers is what's called the Commerce Clause, and that allows the federal government to essentially regulate the economy. That's a big power. And of course, if, if you took a course on U.S. constitutional law, uh, we would go in depth. It's much more complicated than that. But essentially, the federal government can regulate economic matters. Now, of course, that means that it cannot regulate non-economic matters. And so an order from the federal government telling people to stay at home or a lockdown order, a stay at home order, those types of things honestly cannot come from the federal government. 
we we could not have a universal a federal system with top down requirements for lockdown like what you see in other countries. Uh, the federal government simply does not have the power to do it. Now, the federal government has other powers, of course, like the spending power. The federal government spends a huge amount of money. And in fact, much of this money that the states spend comes from the federal government through various programs and, and legislation. And so the federal government certainly through the FTC could be uh, pro promulgating standards, promoting regulations, providing recommendations. And it has been doing that. But it can be difficult for the federal government to actually force the states to do things like a stay at home order because of those federalism concerns. Often the best that the federal government can do is to essentially use the spending power to incentivize the states to do things or threaten to take things away, take money away if the states don't do what the federal government wants. We have not seen aggressive action from the federal government in that sphere though. And that's in large part why the United States has had a patchwork response to the pandemic and you don't see a, a sort of universal or national response that, that's coordinated in as tight a way as it could be. Now, there's politics involved as well, but, but the structure of the Constitution is a big part of it. Beyond just the structure of the Constitution, there's other issues that have certainly popped up or could pop up with re regard to COVID. And in particular, one thing that, that I'd like to mention is religion. So. Of course, the United States has a uh, protection for religious practice under the First Amendment. The federal government uh, and I guess the state governments as well, the government cannot establish or religion or interfere with the free exercise of religion. And essentially, that means that the federal government uh, has to be neutral with respect to religion. And many of these state orders, the stay at home orders or the social dis distancing orders, orders that have limited capacity uh, at various establishments have applied to churches. And so there has been litigation around this. The Supreme Court has taken a look at it. And the basic rule for laws that limit the ability to exercise religion, that affect religious practices, uh, the basic rule there is that they must be neutral in that the legislation cannot target a church or religious practice or treat it any differently than anything else. And so when the Supreme Court looked at the orders and, and the specific case that the Supreme Court looked at was from California, they, they were analyzing, is the state actually treating churches differently than, for example, restaurants or movie theaters and so forth? And in fact, the state was treating them a little bit differently. The, the regulations were tailored based on the type of establishment we were dealing with. And so there was a disagreement. Some justices on the court thought that the way that they were treating churches differently was unconstitutional because they have to be treated like everything else. The majority though, and the holding we ultimately got was that the law was constitutional because those differences in treatment were justified by the fact that churches are different, right? If you go into a grocery store, you're typically moving around and you're not sitting next to someone for an extended period of time. Uh, and so the fact that retail establishments were treated differently than a church, the court said, was justified by neutral factors. And that's essentially the way that any regulation that affects churches will be analyzed. The court is gonna ask, does this treat religion differently because it's religious? And if the answer to that is yes, it could be unconstitutional. It, it probably will be unconstitutional. Another potential issue that I hope comes up is vaccination, right? I hope we get a vaccine soon. I'm sure everyone does. And the way that this could play into the Constitution, or at least one of the ways, would be states requiring vaccination, right? So the, vac the vaccine is only going to be effective if you get to herd immunity, or at least it's only going to protect the country and the general population if a certain number of people are vaccinated, a, a large percentage of people are vaccinated, a large majority, in fact. And so one way that with other diseases that the states have tried to ensure that there's that sort of herd immunity from everyone getting vaccinated is to literally mandate vaccination, to have a legal requirement that people get vaccinated 
or often the way that it's been done is uh, that children need to be vaccinated if they're going to go to school. And a lot of people in the United States are not going to want to take that vaccine, I am sure, when there is a COVID vaccine, because there are people who don't trust the doctors, who don't trust uh, the research. And in fact, you know, it could even become politicized. We don't know. Uh, there's been a little hints of that in, in the campaign so far. And so the, the constitutional question is, could the state force people to get a vaccine? And the answer is, I don't know. Right. Constitutional law is relatively difficult to predict. The Supreme Court is interpreting a document that is very thin. And what I mean by that is there's not much guidance in the Supreme Court. This would be looked at under a fundamental rights, what, what you would probably call human rights perspective of the ability to control your own body, uh, to bodily integrity or to refuse medical treatment. And in the United States, that's looked at under what we call the due process clause of the Constitution. And it just the Constitution simply says that the state shall not deny life, liberty or property without due process of law. And the way the court has looked at that is that a requirement that people have unwanted medical treatment infringes on liberty. Right. It's a violation of liberty. And so that's all the Constitution says is essentially that the state cannot violate liberty. So what does liberty mean? Uh, whatever the Supreme Court says it means at some level. Uh, of course, there's past cases, there's precedent that is built out and that the court should follow. But the Supreme Court of the United States is not bound by past precedent. They can rewrite it. They can change it. They can interpret it. And the most recent case we have on this is from the early 1900s. It's a hundred year old case. And it said that it, with very little explanation, honestly, that the state could allow or could require people to be vaccinated. I believe that was with a smallpox outbreak. And the court basically said that the health benefits outweigh that the public health health benefits for the community outweighed any individual liberty interest. What's interesting about that, though, is that was 100 years ago and there's not a lot of analysis there. It was tied to a particular disease and a particular vaccination. And so it is possible that the Supreme Court could look at this differently. It may even look at the science behind the vaccine, if there is one, uh, or you know, if, if it's pushed and required on people, uh, and determine how safe is it, how effective is it, uh, how much is it going to protect the community, and so forth. And so we don't know for sure if the states can actually require people to get vaccinated. The Constitution, individual rights, could actually prevent that from happening. So I can talk more about COVID. And in fact, I'm going to talk more about COVID when we get to the 2020 election. Uh, I can talk more about it in the Q&A. The next topic I want to move on to is uh, something that has been a huge political issue here in the United States, uh, especially since the summer, and that is police brutality and issues of racial justice in the United States. And this is a constitutional issue. It, it more naturally falls under what we would teach as criminal procedure. Now, when I say criminal procedure, there's actually two different aspects of criminal procedure in the United States. There's what we call the adjudicative side or our criminal procedure that focuses on the trial trial rights and uh, how the trial process works. There's also another side of it, which I teach, which is called investigations and criminal procedure that, that the criminal procedure that governs police investigations is really looking at the police. The adjudicative or trial side is more, more looking at prosecutors and attorneys in the courtroom. And in the investigative pr criminal procedure course that I teach, we cover topics like the use of police force, immunity for when you're going to sue the police, and the constitutional doctrines that govern investigations. Specifically in the Bill of Rights, our fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments are highly relevant there. And so I'm sure you're all or, or virtually all aware of what I'm talking about when I mentioned the protests around racial, racial justice and the basic 
argument of the protests is that the policing system in the United States is broken, that the police disproportionately target racial minorities and racial minorities disproportionately are victims of violence from the police. And so the Constitution is relevant here because it governs what is excessive force? When is uh, when does an investigation or a uh, seizure and arrest go from something that is an ordinary arrest or a justified arrest into something that is actually a violation of rights? And the standard, again, from the Constitution is very vague. And so the Supreme Court has built a test that honestly is very difficult to satisfy. It's it's very hard to show that a police officer used excessive force. Essentially, what you're arguing in an excessive force claim would be that the police did something that was, quote, an unreasonable seizure. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that's all the Constitution's text says, is that a seizure cannot be unreasonable. And so the Supreme Court doctrine has basically said that you judge reasonableness there by looking at all of the circumstances, the totality of the circumstances, and that you should pay particular uh, deference to the police in this in the and what I mean by that is they're making split se- second decisions, their lives might be on the line, and members of the public could be in danger. And so the Supreme Court has looked at a number of these cases where the police do something that is much more aggressive and dangerous than is necessary. And the Supreme Court has said, essentially, yes, the police acted much more aggressively than they needed to. There was a much safer alternative, but that does not mean it's excessive force. And that is because the court is saying it's still a reasonable option, even if it's not the best option. The Constitution does not require the police to do things in the safest manner possible. And that's especially true given that deference we're giving to the police. And they're looking at factors such as what is the nature of the crime? Are there is the suspect running away? Do they pose a threat to anyone? Could the officer have reasonably believed that the suspect was armed, even if the suspect was not armed? And a huge amount of deference is being given to the police there. Not only is the excessive force standard from the Constitution difficult to satisfy, but this is more of a statutory issue that comes up in the criminal procedure course. Police also have what is known as qualified immunity. So there are federal statutes that say you can sue any government official, including the police, if they violate your constitutional rights. However, The Supreme Court has interpreted that to say that the police generally can only be sued if there is a violation of, quote, clearly established rights, end quote. And so what the court is saying there, again, is that we need to protect the police from liability. We need to give deference to the police. The police may make mistakes or they may do something that in hindsight was not the best thing to do. But there shouldn't be liability unless what they were doing was completely unreasonable. That's what the Supreme Court has said. And so in analyzing whether the police have violated a clearly established right, the court is typically asking, are there court cases that are virtually identical to this and have the police essentially violated what we have what the court has already said is unconstitutional. So for example, if the police just randomly searched a home, of course that would be a violation of a clearly established right. There are privacy protections under the Fourth Amendment in your home. But anytime there's factual differences and anytime that there's an argument that what the police were doing was okay, then they're typically gonna be immunized from any liability. What that means is it's very difficult to sue the police, very difficult to sue the police for a violation of your rights. And because of what the Supreme Court has done and they're using constitutional law to do it, that, of course, ties into the argument of the protesters. Right. What they're saying is that the police are not accountable and that there is disproportionate violence against people of color. 
And I think the Supreme Court has essentially created a system that makes that possible, or at least that's what a lot of people have argued anyway. And that is because the, the system is built to protect police. You know, maybe that's justified, maybe it isn't. I don't want to state an opinion there. But in doing so, it has created a lot of discretion for law enforcement. Well, how are law enforcement going to use that discretion? Well, if they're not being held accountable, if they are, they have a huge amount of discretion in who to target for law enforcement, a lot of people say it's virtually inevitable that they're going to target people of color disproportionately because of implicit bias. They may not even realize they're doing it, but that's just how many people's minds work. At least that's what a lot of social scientists say. And so the Constitution has been used basically to insulate police from liability or or direct actions from individuals, meaning that the best way to hold police accountable is through internal governance, probably, without a change in the constitutional law. And what I mean by that is that internal policies at police stations and prosecutors Uh, going after cops within particular police stations, because the Constitution has made it very difficult for individuals to sue the government. Obviously, I could talk a lot more on that, but I want to keep moving through these topics. Um, The next thing I wanted to mention uh, was how the Constitution has actually uh, played out with the protests themselves. So in the last slide, I was mentioning how the Constitution has fed into the motivation for the protests. Well, what about the protests themselves? So obviously, there are free speech rights that uh, apply to protesters in the United States. Under the First Amendment, we have a right to freedom of association and freedom of expression. Now, The protests uh, often, of course, go beyond just expression, or they have in certain circumstances gone beyond simple expression, but the Constitution protects you and your expression in public places, for the most part, what we call public forums. The First Amendment is actually a really complicated topic. It's it's a huge topic in constitutional law at the University of Dayton um, in the JD program. We actually separate it out into two separate courses. Uh, the First Amendment includes religion and speech, and the rest of everything else is covered in the other constitutional law course. It's very complicated. And the First Amendment, the text is not complicated, but the Supreme Court doctrine is, is confusing. And one of the big distinctions that they make are where is the speech taking place? If the speech is in what we call a public forum, meaning the street, a sidewalk, a public park, those types of areas, which is where we see most of these protests, the government essentially can only enact time, place, and manner restrictions. What I mean by that is they have to be reasonable and limiting the time of the protest, where the protest occurs, and the manner of it in terms of how loud or how big the crowds are. And they, what, what, they, what the government simply cannot do is regulate the expression. And yeah, I've actually seen reports of this in the newspaper where you have perhaps vulgar expression, where people are using swear words in their protest signs, and the police have arrested people for that. Well, that's unconstitutional. There, there are Supreme Court cases directly on point that say, no, freedom ex- of expression means you can say anything you want even if other people find it to be offensive. And in fact, so we see these protests for racial justice. We often see counter protests against the Black Lives Matter protests. And the government cannot pick a side. The government has to be neutral. It can provide a forum. And in fact, it has to open up certain forums like the park, uh, the sidewalks, traditional public forums. But it cannot pick a side and treat one side of the debate differently than another. Even if one side is there promoting justice and the other side is promoting Nazism or something like that, what we saw in Charlottesville a number of years ago. And so the the government has to be neutral. It cannot make any sort of content-based distinction. 
I know that's different in many countries where hate speech is regulated. It is not in the United States. With few exceptions, there, there are some ways to get at it that uh, in sentencing guidelines and so forth that I could get to in the Q&A. But for the most part, we have incredibly offensive speech in the United States that is fully constitutionally protected. Now, I mentioned the government can make time, place, or manner regulations. What I mean by that is just something like curfews. We've seen that a lot during the protests. Orders from the government that you have to stay indoors or that you cannot protest beyond a certain point of time at night. As long as those are justified by a neutral uh, factor like maintaining order, or opening up the streets for traffic or something like that, those actually are constitutional. Something that we don't have a clear answer, though, would be a military response to these protests. We saw President Trump in the summer threatening to send in the military to shut down protests, and we've seen, uh, to some extent, military action around these uh, issues um, and, and there were a lot of concerns, and, and perhaps some people still have concerns about uh, the president's use of the military. And the short answer is we don't have a clear answer on the president's authority, and his authority is actually extremely broad. The president is the commander in chief of the military. The United States has a civilian head of the military. The president is in charge of the military. That being said, Congress is also in charge of the military. There are shared responsibilities between uh, the president and Congress with respect to the military. And what I mean by that is that Congress can regulate the military. Congress, of course, uh, passes budgets. Congress funds the military. And so Congress can defund the military. And Congress is essentially in charge of most domestic actions, not the president. Uh, that's a big issue when we look at presidential powers, is that the president has relatively limited power domestically, unless Congress has authorized him to take action. With respect to foreign affairs, the president actually has a huge amount of power. Uh, the, this is somewhat contested, but the Supreme Court and Congress have essentially allowed the president to use the military almost without you know, many limitations internationally uh, in terms of engaging in hostilities and conflict. Yes, there has been pushback from Congress, but usually the president wins those disputes to, to give the, the two-second answer there, and the Supreme Court has largely stayed out of it. So the president has a huge amount of power with respect to using the military overseas, but in terms of using the military domestically, he doesn't have much inherent authority. That's what the Supreme Court has said. But Congress has delegated authority to the president in a number of statutes that arguably give the president the power to send the military out uh, and shut down protests. And of course, this I'm thinking ahead to the 2020 election, where he could, again, use the military to shut down protests over the result or the process or for any sort of issue, it's possible. Uh, there, there are acts on the book that basically give the president the power to use the military to shut down any sort of rebellion against the United States or uh, unlawful obstruction of the laws. Now, these statutes have been on the books since really the beginning of the country, since 1807. Uh, there's an, uh, the, the insurrection statute. And the insurrection statute is, is I, I'm sure what they had in mind were things like the Whiskey Rebellion, things where we have people within the states, um, you know, organized groups within the states rising up. The states don't have, or at least at that point in history, didn't have a great way to respond. And so the president can call the militias and put down any sort of insurrection. The statute's still on the books, though. And so if the president interprets protest as insurrection, he arguably can send the military in. Uh, in fact, presidents have used it throughout history. Uh, President Jackson in the 1820s used it to put down a slave revolt. Uh, president Grant, who uh, the military general in the Civil War, later president, 
used it against the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, during Reconstruction when they, they were terrorizing African Americans in the South. And President Eisenhower used it when uh, there was a popular backlash against, against integration in Arkansas. And Eisenhower used the Insurrection, uh, Insurrection Act to justify sending in federal troops to ensure that black students could go to an integrated school. And so it's possible that President Trump could use similar authority if there are issues in the United States. He threatened to do it this summer with the protests. And of course, no one knows what's going to happen in November. And that, of course, brings me to the next topic I wanted to talk about, and that is the 2020 election. Um, and so, of course, COVID is on everyone's mind here and voting rights. And the Constitution, again, is relatively silent, but is still working in the background. And it's important. The Constitution sets up the process, of course, uh, of the of the election. And in some ways, it's been fortuitous the way that our process works. In some ways, it's not uh, what a lot of people want. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I, was, I was listening to a panel that the University of Dayton put together about a week ago on constitutional issues around the election and ele election integrity. And one thing that I'm sure you've heard about that people are worried about is foreign interference with the U.S. election, right? People are concerned that Russia, China, Iran, North Korea could try to sabotage the election by uh, infiltrating the computer system and potentially even switching votes. And the reason that many people are actually not so worried about that, though, is that we don't have a national election in a sense. The elections are handled by each state. Each state runs its own election, essentially, where it's independent and totally unconnected from the, any, the elections in other states. Uh, and so there's 50 different election you know, systems. And it, it's very difficult, I think, to hack into the 50 different systems. And in fact, within each state, there are different systems and different processes within different counties, within different jurisdictions. And so the, the election, every state has voting on the same day, at least in-person voting, um, but there are actually 50 different elections going on. And when people go in and vote, they're voting for local officials, they're voting for state officials, and they're voting for federal officials. Now, we have a federal election every two years. Every member of the House of Representatives is up for re-election. They sit for two years. And so the composition of the House of Representatives can change dramatically uh, every two years. It usually doesn't, right? Incumbents usually win, but not always. The Senate is much harder to change. Uh, so each state gets two senators. And the composition of the Senate then is going to be, it does not align with the population, right? Because uh, North Dakota, which, or Montana, have very few people. They probably have more cows than people, but they have the same representation in the Senate as California. Uh, and so there, there's malapportionment there if you think about it in terms of population. And uh, Another factor that comes into play, though, that makes it odd is that senators serve six year terms. And so there's only a third of the Senate up for reelection at any given election. And that's why it's so hard for the composition of the Senate to change. Really, the, the Senate is relatively close right now in partisan affiliation. Right. There's uh, basically three or four votes splitting the, uh, the, the Democrats and the Republicans. But because only a third of the Senate is up for re-election, it's, it's difficult to change the composition of the Senate to have it switch from one party to the other. And once a party has control of, once they have a simple majority within the chamber, they can essentially create the rules and run things in the way that they want to run it. They get to chair all the committees, they can uh, call the votes. And then of course, if their members 
vote party line, they, they can pass virtually anything. Now, I mentioned in the Senate, there's that process of the filibuster. That's not constitutional, though. That, that is a process that allows a minority of the Senate to block legislation unless you have a supermajority. You know, so you need more than just 50 percent or 51 percent. There's nothing in the Constitution about it, though. It's just a norm. It's just something that has always been there. And so the Senate has actually eliminated it for judicial nominees, right? That's why, uh, and I'll talk about this later in the, in the next slide, that's why Justice, or well, Judge Amy Coney Barrett will probably go through and become Justice Amy Coney Barrett, because you only need a simple majority. Uh, to confirm a Supreme Court justice. Now, the same could be done. It hasn't been done. The same could be done for ordinary legislation. But anyway, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent there. So at this election, so we have the whole House up, a third of the Senate, and then obviously the president. Every, everyone, I think, uh, has been has seen a little bit of that election process so far. And with uh, you know, with COVID, a lot of people are afraid to vote in person or they would prefer not to vote in person because they're worried about getting, uh, the, you know, becoming infected. And so in the United States, there are different rules for every state, again, about voting remotely, voting early, and there, there's not a one uniform process. I feel comfortable with what my state, the state of Ohio, is doing I was able to vote early. Um, it, most people are, but some states are more restrictive about it. And that is because the Constitution says that the states get to create their own processes. Uh, it's, it's the state government that creates the rules for the election. And of course, some states are controlled by one party. Other states are controlled by another. And so we have different rules. I can't tell you the rule for voting, right? Mail-in voting or, or early voting, because it's different in every state. Um, so with with voting rights, I mean, the Constitution essentially just says that we need to have one person, one vote. W what I mean by that is votes should count equally and that there can be no racial discrimination in voting. Uh, that, that's for the most part what the Constitution has to say about it. One big issue uh, that has come up in the last couple years, but the Supreme Court has decided not to address it, is gerrymandering where states intentionally draw districts to benefit or hurt a particular political party. And the Supreme Court has essentially said it's not going to get involved in that. So the states do that routinely. Those are the big issues I talk about in my constitutional law course about voting. Um, something we don't talk about much because there isn't any case law on it, but it is critically important, is the Electoral College. Uh, you've probably heard about this. It's why President Trump won in 2016, even though he got less votes than Hillary Clinton. And that is because, again, our election process is state by state. It's, it's at the state level. And there's not a popular vote. There's not a national election in that sense. And so each state gets a number of votes. And it's actually not even entirely based on population. The number of votes that a state gets in the Electoral College is based on the number of representatives they have in the federal government. What I mean by that is you ask how many senators and representatives do they have, representatives in the House of Representatives. Now, the House is based on population. The Senate, of course, is not. Every state gets two senators. And so what that means is smaller states in terms of population, um, like Montana, Alaska, North Dakota, they actually get more say in who becomes our president per capita than larger states like New York or Texas. Um, that, that's just sort of a, a, you know, an interesting fact. But another thing that's interesting here is that most, there are two exceptions, but most states have a what's called a winner-take-all system. And so, for example, President Trump could win Ohio by maybe one percentage point. And so, uh, and this is essentially what, you know, he, he won Ohio a little bit more comfortably than that. But uh, millions of people then are voting for the, the losing candidate in Ohio. 
and their votes essentially don't count uh, for, for the presidential tally. And what I mean by that is with most states, they award all of their electoral votes, 100 percent of their electoral votes to whoever won the popular vote in that state. And so what you can have and what's the dynamic that we had in 2016 and then also uh, in 2000 is that you have a, a candidate. And in those instances, it's been a Democrat who runs up large margins in some states. Think New York, California, big populous states that are heavily leaning towards that party. And so they win those states by a lot of votes and they get all of the electoral votes from those states. But then they lose a number of states narrowly, like Ohio, Florida, Georgia, Texas. They get millions of votes in those states, tens of millions of votes in those states, but they actually get zero electoral votes from those states because it's a winner takes all system. And you might ask, why do we have that system? Shouldn't the person with the most votes win? It's really a matter of legal history. Uh, there are a number of issues going into it. Uh, it, that, that I could talk about in the Q&A, but uh, it, it really is just a matter of legal history. It's what the framers decided and uh, from <laughs> a couple hundred years ago, and it's very difficult to amend the Constitution. You need uh, two-thirds of Congress and three-fourths of the states to agree to it, and I don't think that the states are going to do that. I mean, I don't, I don't think that the people would agree to that because structurally, at least in the last couple decades, it has favored one of the political parties. And so they're not going to want to give up that advantage. Election disputes, if we have any, um, should be resolved. Uh, you know, I say should be. Uh, ideally, they're resolved within each state, right? If there's an issue within one state about an, uh, something with the election, maybe a polling place got shut down, uh, maybe the, the count is they, they need a recount, there was something wrong with the tally. Ideally, that should be handled internally within the state. And then the state, uh, the legislature and the governor then are going to certify where their electoral votes are going to go, essentially. There could be a dispute, though, right? There could be a dispute about that, which you know could be resolved in the state courts. The Supreme Court could get involved then if there's a federal constitutional issue the Supreme Court could get involved. And that, of course, is what we saw in the year 2000 when uh, in the Bush v. Gore election. And we have the famous Supreme Court case, Bush v. Gore. And uh, so there's there's potential for the Supreme Court to resolve legal issues that would arise during the election. The other possibility is that if no one hits the majority of electoral votes that is required, it is possible that we could go back to the fallback provision in the U.S. Constitution for selecting the president. That fallback position is rather strange, and it has happened before. Uh, I don't think it's happened since the 1820s, but um, it, it has happened before. And it would go to the House of Representatives. Now, you might think, well, that just means Biden would be president because Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats control the the house that's actually not true it doesn't go to the house of representatives for a vote from the house of representatives in the normal way each state gets one vote and so again montana would have the same say in who the president is as california even though their populations are very different and so it's not clear who would win that contest of course we would hope that the representatives consider more than just partisan politics. Uh, but but the, the process we have is very strange. It, if the states, if no one gets a majority vote from the state certified electoral votes, it goes to the House of Representatives who vote on a one state, one vote basis. And um, if no one is president by January 20th, guess what? it goes down the order of succession, it should be the Speaker of the House, uh, is what the Constitution says. So Speaker Pelosi would then become an interim temporary president, at least that's the way formally in the Constitution it should work, if we're still in an election dispute come January 20th. 
Um, so, so obviously there's more that we could say there, but I wanted to leave time for Q&A. So I, the, the last topic I wanted to talk about is the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court is incredibly important. It's setting all of those rules that I've been talking about in this entire lecture, and of course, many, many more. Uh, it, it's, it's a very important part of the government. And it has by sort of tradition, since the Civil War, which took place in the 1860s, uh, or well, during Reconstruction, since about, for more than 100 years, it has had nine justices. And the way those justices are selected is relatively simple. If there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, you could have a justice retiring or passing away while on the bench. The president nominates someone to fill that seat. There are no constitutional requirements about who they have to nominate. Technically, it doesn't even need to be a lawyer. Obviously, it will be. Um, but, you know, back in the 1700s, there weren't many law schools. I think, in fact, there was just one in the United States. I think it was just Harvard. Um, but but it, there are no technical requirements in the Constitution about who has to be nominated. It's more just a matter of norms and, you know, just obvious common sense that it usually is someone who has already served as a judge. That has been the norm lately. Someone who is a, already a federal judge is typically selected. It doesn't have to be, though. We've had politicians who are appointed. Uh, Chief Justice Warren is a really well-known uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice, and he was the governor of uh, California. Uh, President Taft became Supreme Court Justice Taft. Uh, there, there are interesting examples of those types of things. And so the process is just someone gets nominated by the Supreme Court, and then that individual has to be confirmed by a majority vote in the Senate. That, that is an important you know, second step of the process. And what we have going on right now, a, a huge issue, is that Justice Ginsburg passed away recently, and President Trump has appointed, uh, has nominated Amy Coney Barrett, who is currently a sitting judge in the federal appellate courts, so the level of courts below the Supreme Court, uh, she has been tapped to replace Justice Ginsburg. And we are in the Senate confirmation process now. I don't, I don't know if you've seen any of the coverage of that, but typically the justices do not answer much. They don't say much during the confirmation process. And that's that's been the norm uh, in, in the last, well, number of decades. And that, that really started around when Justice Ginsburg first came to the court. Before her nomination, there was a failed nomination of someone who was rather vocal, uh, Judge Bork, who was vocal on the conservative side. And he was not confirmed, some people say, perhaps because of that. After that happened, the justices just or, or the, the nominees started to refuse to answer questions. And, and that's essentially what Judge Barrett has been doing. She hasn't given much in the way of concrete answers during the Senate process. And so the senators are voting based on what? Based on her record, based on her resume, and also based on partisan affiliation. I expect that it will be a party line vote on whether she should sit on the Supreme Court. And she will probably be confirmed relatively quickly and easily because the Republican majority has a sufficient number of votes to go through. Uh, a couple Republicans in the Senate have said that they will not vote for her prior to the election. But the way the Senate works, right, we have a round number. It's 100 senators because we have 50 states. And the tie-breaking vote is cast by the vice president. And so uh, that would be uh, Vice President Pence. And so they can, the Republican majority can stand a couple defections. Okay, they still have enough votes to get her confirmed. And she would immediately sit on the court and immediately be able to hear any issue that would come before the court. There are no rules governing 
what cases a Supreme Court justice can hear. None. There are ethical suggestions, you might say, or norms that do apply to other judges, but they do not technically apply to the Supreme Court. What that means is there were questions during the confirmation process about whether Judge Barrett would recuse herself or say that she would not participate in a case about the 2020 election if it came before her. And she would not say one way, one way or the other what she would do. That's expected. The, the uh, nominees rarely answer questions directly. But what's interesting is there are no rules to govern that. It will be a personal decision for her. There are ethical standards and there are uh, rules that would apply to people in similar situations, but they don't technically apply to her. And so it is very realistic to think that she could rule on a case about the 2020 election. A lot of people are somewhat concerned about that because, of course, the 2000 election that I mentioned between George W. Bush and Al Gore was essentially decided, uh, or, or at least the, the process ended with a Supreme Court decision. A Supreme Court decision about recounting votes in Florida and, and the vote counting process in the state of Florida. And so it's possible that the same thing could happen and, and Judge Barrett would probably be involved. I mean, she definitely would be involved unless she recuses herself. And, that, and that's really just a personal decision for her. Certainly, there's a lot more I could talk about with the Supreme Court. Let me just say a few words on how the president, then I said that the president can essentially pick anyone. Uh, it's an appointment process. Well, all federal judges are, are, it's the same standard. Whether it's a trial judge or an appellate judge, it's the same standard. The president appoints that judge and they have to be confirmed by the Senate. So it's an appointment process. With the states, they can choose whatever system they would like. And many states have judges who are elected by the people. Um, and so it's really up to the state how they run their system. And it's, it's split. So in some states, there are elections for certain judges and not others. In some states, virtually all judges are elected. And in some states, virtually no judges are elected. Um, and so, so the process at the state level is going to vary state by state. At the federal level, the same whether you're a Supreme Court justice or whether you are a trial judge. Now, of course, much more attention is paid to the Supreme Court because the stakes are so much higher. Um, but, but those other judges are very important, and they typically are going to be the people who will eventually uh, you, you know, most of our Supreme Court justices are pulled from the lower federal courts as well. So those are important positions. Um, and just very briefly, there's a lot of discussion in the media that the change in the composition of the court could be very significant. Justice Ginsburg was known as one of the, probably the most liberal justice on the court liberal in terms of individual rights, human rights, in terms of uh, just a number of different issues, and allowing for big government and deferential to Congress in terms of the laws that it passes. Uh, a Justice Barrett is expected to be her polar opposite in terms of how she would vote. Uh, she is expected, of course, we don't know, but based on her record and her statements that she has made and her writings, uh, it is predicted that she will be among the most conservative justices on the court, uh, meaning that she may interpret federal individual rights protections more narrowly and that she may interpret federal power much more narrowly, making it more difficult for the federal government to pass new regulatory programs or uh, more difficult for agents, federal agencies to act independently of the president. There's, there's a lot more I could say, but I think, you, you know, it's uh, I've been going on now for the better part of an hour and, and we have a half hour left. So um, I do want to have time for Q&A. So I think 
um, it might make sense to 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 go to that question and ask, uh, answer period and see what you all want me to talk more about uh, before I go into detail on any particular area that the Supreme Court might might hear. Okay, so I think uh, we have a couple of questions from the students. I'm just checking. Um, in the chat. So the first I have here is how many votes does she need to be confirmed? I think uh, it's talking about Justice uh, yeah, potentially Barrett to the court. How, how many votes, Jeff? So she needs 50 votes. Uh, so the Senate has 100 members, right? And so if it were split 50 50, then the tie breaking vote would come from Vice President Pence. So she needs 50 votes. Okay. So uh, another question I have here is going back to the Electoral College and the presidential election, does the number of electors each state abstains have to do with the population of that particular state? The larger the state, the more electors they get? Yes, but it's, it's not perfectly proportionate. And what I mean by that is, the amount or the number of votes you get in the Electoral College equals the number of representatives you have in the federal government. Now, the House of Representatives is proportionate based on population, it's equal, but the Senate is not. And so the, the minimum number of votes any state has is three. So our least populous state, which I believe is Alaska, uh, has three votes. That's disproportionate, right? They're getting a bigger say. They're getting per person. They're getting more of a say in the president. Uh, now, it so happens, though, that those small states are relatively spread out. You know, there's there's a lot of rural states that lean Republican, but there are actually some small states that lean towards the left, towards Democrats, especially in the Northeast, like Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. And so it so happens that it's not, it hasn't been a huge effect. The, the disproportionate votes uh, haven't really, haven't had a huge effect on the outcome, but, but it could in the future. All right, and um, I have another one here. What's your stance in be part of the system? Do you think it might change in the future? You mean the Electoral College? Uh, I, I think, uh, his uh, more uh, the question is more related to the two big parties in the U.S. the bipartisan system like uh, Republican, Republic oh. and Democrats. Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea. So the parties are always changing. They're always evolving, and they they sometimes change positions on big issues. Um, and so you know, it, an obvious example is that the Republican Party was the party of Abraham Lincoln, the party that destroyed slavery, uh, at least formally. And now the overwhelming majority of African-Americans support the Democratic Party. Um, so, so there are changes, and uh, there, there have been throughout time, but the Republican and Democratic parties have been stable since the Civil War, right? Prior to the Civil War, there were different parties that you know, you know, came into existence and then fell apart. It's been stable for a long time, though, you know, over 150 years. My personal guess is that that continues, but that the Republican or Democratic Party of today may bear little resemblance to what they are 50 years from now. Oh, okay. Thank you. And I have uh, one on the police. So when you mentioned police regulation, you said that as the Constitution kind of allowed them to behave the way they do, the topic. Uh, should be managed by internal policies? Right. So what I meant by that is it's very difficult for individuals to sue the police. So, so there are, let me just take a step back, right? So if you think about tort law, right? Tort law is where you're suing someone because they behave wrongly and it caused you injury, right? Maybe they were negligent. Maybe there was an intentional tort. They trespassed. They destroyed your property. Well, what do you do if somebody destroys your stuff? You sue them, right? Or if somebody is violent towards you, sure, they may be criminally prosecuted, but you could also sue them for money. And what I was trying to say is that through qualified immunity 
and excessive force doctrine, it's very difficult to hold the police accountable through the tort system. And the way that the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments have been interpreted, there's not much constitutional, well, the Constitution gives the police a lot of discretion in how to conduct investigations. And so how do you check police abuse or police misconduct? It, it almost, it, it's hard to, for individuals to do it, is what I was trying to say. You need the city itself to, to, to create rules, to enforce rules, maybe through hiring practices, internal discipline, or the state to pass laws that uh, regulate police more than what the federal government is doing. The, the federal constitutional system allows a lot of discretion for the police and makes it hard to hold the police accountable. That does not make it impossible, but it makes it hard. And so it, the, the most effective ways to regulate the police would be through the, 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 the police office itself, through internal hiring and discipline policies at the police station. Okay, and I have two more. Uh, the, fir the first one says, uh, can this state control remote voting or voting by email? How do they make sure of the identity of the voter or that person does not cast a vote twice? So I'm, I'm no expert on this, but I, I did sit in on a panel that we had with the voting commissioner of the state of Ohio, and she made me feel pretty comfortable about the process. So we do not, I, I'm not aware of any state that allows voting by email or electronically. I think there are too many concerns that there could be interference or, or manipulation. Instead, what we have are mail-in ballots. Those are physical and you have to sign them. And they're, they're tracked, right? So you have to, it depends on the state. In some states, they can be sent automatically. In some states, you have to request them. Um, and I had to request it. And then it is mailed to me. I mail it back. They keep track of it. And there's, there's a logging system. So Within 48 hours after mailing my vote, I could go on the internet and check to make sure that it was counted. Now, it doesn't tell me, it doesn't say who I voted for. It's not a tally. It's just, it's just somebody clicked a box at the, at the voting office saying, yes, this was received. And they, they align it with all, everyone who's registered to vote, right? You have to register to vote ahead of time. And so they make sure that only one person is voting. Um, and just... From what I've read, there has been very low instances of any sort of voter fraud or manipulation. They're very careful. And in fact, there are bipartisan checks on the counting and the process. I, I actually feel pretty, pretty good about the fact that the votes will be counted for the most part in the way that they are cast. Okay. And the last one, this is a pretty broad question. So... I, I don't know if you can sum up the key points. It says you said people elect judge, uh, judges in in at the state level. So how is that process? Because it's something that is unusual for us. Because in Argentina we don't have uh, elections uh, at the judicial system. Okay, they are appointed by a kind of a specialized body. So you have to sit for an exam in order to be a judge. Uh, so how uh, the the question is how people just go there and vote when when they pick up for representatives when they have to elect they vote for judges too yeah um actually the answer to that is yes so it, it, it at any given election there are often judges running for office in the states that have elected judges and it, it does sound strange to a lot of people because the judges are supposed to generally be neutral uh, not influenced by politics. That's why we have appointment at the federal level. That's why we have lifetime tenure. Um, and so there are definitely concerns that elected judges could vote differently because they're worried about the process. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I think there, there are arguments for uh, having the elected system. And, I, you know, I, I could talk about this, for, you know, for a pretty long period of time, but but uh, the the as I kept saying, the constitutional law is relatively indeterminate. It doesn't necessarily have a clear answer. I mean, it's not math, 
And so the idea behind elected judges is that not just in constitutional law, but in every field, the judges are exercising their discretion, right? They are, in a sense, changing the law. They're, they're Through the common law process, the law is evolving by the courts. And who, so, so that means that who sits on the bench matters. And there's this idea, and this really became popular in the 1800s, this idea of responsive democracy applying, of course, to our elected officials in, in the legislature and the executive, but also to the judiciary. And it's because the, the, there became this sort of idea that the judges are doing the same thing as the legislature to some level. They are, their views are changing the policy, uh, the, the state's rules, the policy, the, the rules that govern us in a very real way. And so those people should be responsive to the electorate and they should have the same values as everyone else. And in, in fact, you know, that, that the election system hasn't changed in a lot of states. You know, it's, it's been there for a very long period of time. It seems to work reasonably well. Um, the, 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 you know, I gave you the technical rules, but, but in real life, there are bodies that, uh, you, you know, like the ABA, the, the, there are neutral bodies that, that look at the candidates and they say, are they rate them? And they, there's a determination. Do they have the qualifications? Right. Um, now, sometimes the people or the president doesn't listen to those ratings, but usually they do. And so there there are experts that there, there are there is a neutral system that is making sure that these people are well qualified. Uh, but but, yeah, it can be partisan as well. You know, the judges will have political affiliations often. And uh, it, it a lot of times, you know, just to be perfectly honest and from my experience talking to people in the United States, they don't know who the judges they're voting for are sometimes. Um, and oftentimes they're running unopposed, which means that they're the only they're basically the only person who wants the job uh, or at least the only one who wants no one bothered to run against them because they thought they would lose. And um, that usually means that the bar is relatively happy with that person. Right. If, if they were doing something crazy, if everyone hated them, that they would probably not be unopposed. I mean, they're, then it's easier to run against them. So. The system manages to work, even though it does sound strange to some people, I realize. Okay. Uh, Paula, I don't know if you are there. I have two more questions. I don't know how are we doing with time. Okay, you can go ahead to do two more questions and we will close the, the webinar with the upcoming events. Okay, so I have two more questions. The first one says, regarding laws, which would you use? Which would you say that would be the most important challenge in the U.S.? This is the first one, and the second one. I will make to the two questions together, if if that's okay with you, Jeff. The first one says regarding law, which would say that would be the most important challenge in the U.S.? And the second one: Can school, based on health protocol, ban unvaccinating children to attend face-to-face -face classes? So on the first question, which law? I take that the way I'm going to interpret the question is which law is the Supreme Court going to look at that that is the most important? I think it's the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that, that's been the main issue that the Democrats keep raising in the confirmation battle is that they're saying that don't confirm Judge Barrett because then we're going to lose the Affordable Care Act. And the Affordable Care Act is President Obama's signature domestic achievement. It expanded health care coverage to to I think 20 some million people who hadn't had it before uh, through various provisions. And it's being challenged in the Supreme Court as we speak. And th there's a lot of concern that the Supreme Court could declare it to be unconstitutional. I, I won't get into the specifics. It's, it's somewhat complicated, but it, it is very possible that Judge Barrett would vote with the majority um, and that without her, that, that she will be the deciding vote. I mean, just based on court watchers say, based on the way that it's split now, she may actually tip the scales and make the Affordable Care Act be struck down. And that would have huge implications for millions of people. Um, it just, 
in terms of losing health care, which this is not great timing for you to lose your health care for obvious reasons. Uh, so practically, that seems like a big deal. Um, on, on the school issue, I don't have an answer, right? I mean, I, there's there's precedent from 100 years ago saying, yes, you could do it for smallpox. Now, does that mean the Supreme Court's going to say the same thing today? Probably, but maybe not, right? The situation is going to be very different. The law there is not incredibly clear. They didn't say the state has complete authority over this, right? There's a liberty interest in being able to parent your children and in being able to refuse unwanted physical intrusions into your body. Um, and so the court might look at the science behind the vaccine. How safe is it? How effective is it? Um, and and how necessary is it, right? So you could have a vaccine that's only 50% effective, right? You could have a vaccine that has some serious side effects. So it, it's hard to say. Okay, well, Jeff, thank you so much for your time and this excellent presentation. Uh, it, it was a pleasure for, for the law school at Wally to have you here. And I will give the, the floor to Paula. Paula, please. Okay, well, thank you, Dan Schmidt. It has been a pleasure. Uh, it seems like you really like what you do because you show so much enthusiasm, uh, you know, in giving the class. So thank you very much for this. We could feel it. So, and this is very. Thank you. Thank you. I love the law. It's my core course. So thank you <laughs> for listening and, and letting me talk. Congratulations. Um, to the students, uh, please keep tuned. We're going to have another webinar on November 10th. You're going to see all the flyers on our social networks. And we're going to speak about um, what's coming next uh, between WADE and the University of Eight. So see you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Bye-bye. Thank you.